I think that just as we're living in a nuclear age, we have grown so tremendously in scientific knowledge, it doesn't seem uh, too much to say that men can begin to awaken to the fact that they have, haven't grown enough spiritually and haven't recognized their spiritual capacities. Once something like eating is death, then you've struck at the very heart of life. The enemy of the older radical theories may have been the ruling class, but today the stakes of whether we will reform ourselves into a new kind of human being, a new kind of society, whether we will find selves worth being, the stakes of it are simply life itself. Okay, folks, um, welcome back to another edition of Hillbilly Elegy, the book club. And um, today, as promised, I want to start off by um, just talking about some of the comments that um, I've gotten on the last two um, book club videos. Uh, and then I want to cover just some of the highlights of chapter seven through nine, because there's a lot of chapters in this book and there's a lot going on. In fact, so much going on that it does get confusing. Um, it gives you the same sense um, that J.D. Vance must have had um, in his own life when he was growing up, and um, because even describing it is confusing and exhausting, actually. So um, at any rate, let us first deal with your comments. From the ironies of elegy, um, we have number six, who says psychology, social psychology, and other mainly social and life sciences are, as Republican think tanks realized, intensely undermining to almost all neoliberal policies. Um, yes, I mean, the more that we understand, the less uh, simplified we can make, uh, you know, our, um, our solutions, right? And uh, Mighty Lotan says... I'm going to guess donut shops were not mentioned in his book because he definitely seemed out of his element in one on the campaign trail. I uh, I didn't actually watch that news story, but I've seen other incidents of that. What was that, uh, like George Bush back in the day, you know, encountering um, a scanning mechanism in a grocery store, and it was baffling um, him. Anyway, uh, yeah, like... <laughs> And then on the next, well, the last one I did, which was entitled Why the Serial Marriages, Infidelities, Fights, and Kids Raised by Grandparents, there's quite a few comments here. One person says, and I won't read it all because it's quite long, so you might want to go back and read this whole thing, but uh, he says, growing up in small town Kansas, I was always impressed upon by my elders to make something of myself. Uh, from many I know personally, they are in dire straits because of bad attitudes, lack of a work ethic, or being unwilling to apply oneself to studies. The most immediate cultural factors are those related to manhood, the primacy of sports over academics in many schools, and a certain notion of manliness that gets in the way of sober thinking. In much of America, they value the man who can win in a fight so teenagers and young men spend a lot of time in the weight room, with some taking martial arts classes. The football hero is the ideal, not the math whiz. We are becoming the land of the movie Idiocracy. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, thanks for the mention of the movie. If you haven't watched Idiocracy, it is funny, it's also sad, and it's prophetic. And everybody should watch it. You will laugh. Um, but you'll sort of be like, ah, yeah, but, you know, you know, I'm kind of like, it's also scary because you can see how we could end up in a, in a world that is depicted in Id idiocracy where somebody basically um, uh, gets frozen in a, in a pod long enough to make it to multiple hundreds of years in the future. And people are so dumb that they that they think that they can put, um, they can water their plants using, I think it's called Brondo, but basically it's um, sport drink, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that mention. But as to the point about, um, you know, the cultural problem of a certain type of manhood, um, 
Yeah, that is a thing, right? Like for whatever reason, boys, not just in rural areas, but I think in, in um, but maybe in particular, um, but pretty much everywhere are encouraged to do things or at least not discouraged from doing things that get in the way of their success. And um, young women are beginning to definitely get ahead of them in a lot of fields, you know, I mean, between sports, which you mentioned, um, being overvalued and just the whole macho physical strength thing being overvalued. Um, and then, you know, the, the, not taking away video games, not greatly restricting video games uh, in boys. Boys love video games. And to this day, girls don't love them as much <laughs> is my observation, you know, because I think boys are wired for this ahead of times. I think, you know, but even if it's just cultural, the fact is that, you know, boys spend a lot more time on that kind of activity. Well, it's so much of their time and that they don't have a lot of time to do other things that might um, further their further the, the development of their brain more. Um, and also, I mean, let's not forget that in a lot of schools, and I would assume in rural areas, I didn't grow up in a rural area, but I've noticed that a lot of the same pathologies that exist in like inner city schools, which is where I grew up, are very similar to the pathologies in um, in rural schools and society. Um, there's a There was definitely a sense that a smart person was going to be unpopular and basically somebody that you wanted to like basically punch okay and <laughs> to be to be very brutally like short about it um to be popular was not to be smart and um and you know so there's this weird sort of um culture that develops not just with men but with our boys but also girls um in these areas where what you uh what society later expects and really wants in young people is actually put down by not only their felt you know your fellow students but also by the parents if you guys don't recognize that um that sentiment i'd be surprised basically i had to play dumb for much of my um lower education you might say so that i didn't get punched in the face okay so um yeah, I think that's a thing. On the other hand, um, why do we have this culture, right? Why do we have, especially accentuated with the boys, why do we have this? And I think if we look beyond just, you know, okay, this is what parents um, teach their kids. That's true. Why do they do that? What's driving our culture? And I think what you what you have to consider is that there's a lot of people making money off of this culture and the economy doesn't care whether boys lose or girls and women lose or whether anybody loses as long as there are the people who are making money keep making money. And so a lot of that, um, that man stuff, you know, with sports and video games and just, you know, all this stuff, um, also all the feminine stuff. I mean, our economy, I don't know how, how, how much of a percent would you estimate is stimulated by people's attempt to be hyper-masculine or hyper-feminine um, to cover up who they really are and to avoid work and all of these things that we say we don't admire, Um but, you know, can the consumer capitalist economy definitely has no problem with any of these things and doesn't give a good dang <laughs> whether, you know, men in America are able to do jobs in a concerted fashion or whether we need to find more people from other countries to do those same jobs. Doesn't care. So I would just encourage people to kind of zoom out a bit. A lot of times these cultural pathologies um, we can see as created within a larger context that encourages them or doesn't have any problem with them. You know, it can thrive whether these things change or not. And um, this means that when we try to change them from below, unless we also change the context 
So it isn't encouraging these things. I mean, how many billions of dollars are being made off of those video games and off of movies and, you know, all the toys and crap that many kids can't afford, but they all want, right? People are getting rich off of this stuff. This is so, so they don't want it to stop. They don't want it to stop. So I just, I would encourage people to just think, think broader, think about all the parts involved in creating this and not just the people that end up making bad decisions about how to raise their kids or the kid himself who's like, yeah, I want to play video games for eight hours a day. That kid's not in a vacuum and neither are his parents. Um, but you, you got an excellent point there. Um, this is from Blankenship. And um, I encourage everybody to go and read that. I think he's speaking um, uh, the truth for a lot of people's experience there. Yeah, another guy in response says the primary issue is elite overproduction and competition, which drives wealth inequality. Convincing more football players to learn math will only accentuate these problems. Well, I mean, accelerate. Yeah, uh, you guys should read, if you haven't already, the book Bullshit Jobs. Um, that is also a thing. Um, and that, too, is caused by the fact that if we have, if, if our economy is to continue to grow and support everybody and continue to uh, grow at the rate needed to um, to maintain a lot of people's lifestyles, it needs that money needs to go somewhere. And more and more, it goes into unproductive things. Now, the video games are unproductive things. The makeup, the excessive, you know, beauty products, the all all the clothes, the technology, the new phones every other year, all that is also overproduction, right? It's a place where money can go where it's um, you know, it will only last a while and then you need to you need to buy more, right? Um, and elite overproduction of creating jobs that really don't seem to be all that productive, all sorts of middle layers, bureaucratic layers in corporate as well as in government uh, businesses and enterprises and operations. That's another place money can go. And at the point we are, it seems essential for all that money to keep flowing into these unproductive and wasteful areas in order to keep the economy going and growing at a rate, right, that we need. And the thought of that, uh, yes, that makes us kind of disgusted. We look at it and we're like, uh, you know, it's making us soft. It's making us entitled, or many of us, the wealthy anyway, and the middle class, the professional middle class. Um but it's also, you know, if you think about um, just taking those things away, oh, let's eliminate all the bullshit jobs. We'd have a, we have an economic crisis like you wouldn't believe. That's how interwoven all of these things are. And are in order to solve them, we would have to be very, very, very careful in a way that we probably can't be at this point. But we can always hope. Um, and number six weighs in again, and I know that that's a reference, by the way, to The Prisoner, a British TV show that I was acquainted with, um, oh, I don't know, 20 years ago or something like that. If you guys haven't seen it, it's worth checking out. But anyway, I know what that reference is, and I, I don't think you are the person who introduced me to that reference because... The what you say just doesn't seem like anything that person would say. You make a lot more sense. <laughs> anyway, um, you say it looks like as if Vance, like Bill Clinton and Condoleezza Rice, may belong to the 5% of children who are invulnerable to lasting emotional harm from childhood abuse. And also like them, he'll take the 95% to task for not doing better. Well, uh, yes and no. Like, I get your sentiment there. You're saying, you know, he's not, um, you know, he's not um, looking at the other people who are damaged with enough, with enough empathy. I agree with that. I agree with that. I, I think that that's exactly what I'm saying, right? Um, and so he's sort of still blaming the victim, but he, but I also think he is a victim, and I think he may think he's invulnerable. But I think we can see that um, this is a in, in, essentially 
an inherently damaged, deeply damaged person from exactly what he describes here. This would take a lot to get over. And uh, I don't know if it could be done. And so if you're trying to understand why, you know, um, the whys of Vance, among the things you have to calculate in, is that this guy had a horrendous childhood. And we know, and I've said this before, when you have this kind of horrendous childhood, it will follow you. And in order to get over it, if you ever could, you would have to go to a lot of good therapy and you would have to try really hard and be very, very clear on it. And a lot of people just won't do that. So I think we have to give some um, empathy and sympathy there. Um, you know, a lot of folks listening to this probably don't like J.D. Vance. I don't like his positions. I don't like the fact that he's changed his mind about some pretty um, important things. I wouldn't support him as a politician, but I do feel bad for him as a human being. Um, and I think the book represents the type of person that we need to give serious attention to in our society so that everything can be a little bit better for us all. So good point there, number six. But yeah, think about that. Think about um, the fact that he probably is not at all invulnerable, but he may think that he is. All right. So thanks for those comments. Um, and yeah, like uh, there's so much going on in this book, right, that I basically ended up, as I went through it again, um, doing bookmarks. I'm using a Kindle. <laughs> Sorry, people. I know I, I do prefer um, Kindle editions. One thing that I wanted to mention is, you know, the, the time when Vance finally realizes that a lot of his mom's behavior has probably been caused by substance abuse, but it was pretty hidden. And then um, there was this point, and it was after um, Papa died, her her dad died, that um, he could see um, this weakness, a weakness and vulnerability. And then basically she just spiraled. And she spiraled because she was a nurse at a hospital, remember? And she began to um, be able to, she began to figure out how to steal the uh, narcotics. And she uh, was ba basically a pretty, pretty deep drug addict by the time uh, this happened. And this event just sent her into an absolute spiral Um and, you know, it was it became extremely obvious. I've been around people that were so like addled on narcotics that uh, they could barely like keep their head upright um, and their mouth was hanging open. And he d he does describe his mom in this in, as um, in this way and also just extremely irrational and violent. Um, by this point, she'd been she'd been remarried again. Uh, I think to a guy named Ken and that he was living with them at the time. Honestly, he was in and out of people's homes so much that I'm not even going to try to keep track of that, but I'm just going to tell you that, you know, he bounced around from his grandmother, mamma's house to his mom's house and whoever she happened to be with to his bio dad for a while, um, who was a fairly decent guy. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And then, you know, back to Mama again. So his mom got sent off to rehab. And then he was with um, just his sister for a while with, I'm sure, Mama kind of looking on and making sure they were okay. But it sounds like for a while they did live on their own because um, mom went to rehab. And she got out, came home. He lived with her for a while more. Okay, and then I've got a bookmark here in Chapter 8. He says that he did some drug experimentation himself, um, and that's totally understandable. He said it was uh, fairly light use, like normal, if you can call it that, normal, like teenage use, I guess, of alcohol and uh, pot. And so, you know, nothing major there, but noteworthy because, you know, in a family where 
there was quite a bit of alcohol and drug abuse, he also was tempted to do it, which is super common. In fact, probably it's um, so common that it's very much the weird exception to the rule if somebody coming from a family like that um, is sober, you know, all the time or doesn't sometimes look at drugs or alcohol as a way to kind of at least moderately self-medicate so they can like deal with their lives. Um, and you got to give him some credit that this didn't um, overtake his life. But he describes in, I think, the next chapter, this episode where, you know, mom falls off the wagon after being on it for a while and but needs a drug test to be, be able to. I may I may be maybe that's like even before. See, I'm confused. But anyway, at a certain point, she got to get that drug test and um, she knows she can't pass it. So she goes to him for the, um, you know, for the clean pee. And he's, uh, he ends up doing it because he gets reassured that, no, even if you've like smoked pot a little bit in the last three weeks, you're probably not going to test positive. I am, I, I, I don't know. That's never happened to me, but like, uh, apparently he got good advice, uh, went ahead and donated, but then felt really bad about it because it was enabling his mom to continue with her addiction. He later regretted it. I don't think he did it again. Um, and he became more like clear on the fact that this was, that his mom had really failed at that point in time, you know, failed him that is, was failing him at that point in time. This woman had her good times and her bad times. And clearly when she was in her right mind and not using, she was capable of really loving and caring for her family. So this is truly a story of, you know, of like what addiction can do uh, to people and their families. Oh yeah, yeah, that your analysis story happens at the beginning of chapter nine. If I were to tell people like, what chapter should you read up to chapter nine, you know, one through nine, if you didn't want to read them all, I would say read chapter nine because in chapter nine, he starts to kind of make some more adult observations because at this point in his life, as he's describing, he's in his teen years. He's starting to think more systematically about what's going on, why these things happened. Um, you know, is it society's fault? Is it the government's fault? Is it the business people's fault? Is it just the people's fault? He's starting to think of these things in a more sophisticated way. He also realizes that he does have some academic ability. He's living with Mama at this point, and he's really quite grateful. He appreciates her. She's not exactly a ste you know like a stellar role model on all counts, but she pretty she's pretty solid, and she really cares about him. And she bought him a calculator, a, cal a graphing calculator that was expensive back then, um, so that he could do his best in this teacher's class, this teacher by the name of Selby, who was a really strong influence on him, really admirable. And, uh, you know, he was grateful for that. And by the way, that the account of Selby in this book is worth reading the chapter for, because it reminds you how one good school teacher can make an absolute difference in your kid's life. Okay. But in order to do that, you have to pay them well, people, and you have to stop harassing them and telling them exactly how to teach your kids. I'm just saying, like having talked to so many of these school teachers, we're driving them out. And then the other thing that drives them out, other than, you know, helicopter parents and low pay is like all this bureaucratic stuff that they have to do instead of just dealing with teaching their kids. That's a side point, but for all you teachers out there, tell me I'm wrong, okay? Every teacher I've talked to has said that. So this guy, Selby, um, had a very positive influence on his life, and um, between Mama and him, he remembered to be better at school, to, you know, to go to school, to start doing his work, because he had previously been pretty sketchy on the academic front because of everything that was going on. So he began to see that he had that potential. And then Mama also made him get a job. He didn't want to get a job at first, but she made him get a job at a grocery store as a cashier, and that was really good for him. And along the way, he started exercise his as he puts it, sociologist brain, where he was observing people's behavior in the grocery store. 
And he looked at this very common economic maneuver, which is totally normal in a capitalist economy, by the way, where the people on welfare would um, go and buy the things at the grocery store that they could buy on welfare. And then he would turn around and sell that at a discount and take the cash and go get what they wanted to. You know, maybe it would be a steak or maybe be a six pack of beer or whatever. This is absolutely rational capitalist behavior. It's sophisticated, basically. Like, I mean, it's commerce, right? So I've never been able to like really cast a lot of blame on people in an economy where we are inundated by like appeals to to be like self-indulgent and to try to get whatever you want that will make you happy and supposedly will make you fulfilled and feel like a decent human being or loved or whatever it is. You know, if I buy that shampoo and have a steak, <laughs> I'm going to feel like a human being and like somebody might want to actually love me and talk to me. This is what our economy constantly, you know, bombards people with the, these messages. So of course, if if you're like, in the welfare system occasionally at least you're gonna you're gonna like commit commerce and um and become a sort of middleman uh so that you can like turn commodities back into cash and buy what you want um uh, i i don't know like i we expect welfare people on welfare to be way stronger than people who aren't on welfare and later on in this chapter he does say like what's wrong with you know he's sort of like speculating what is wrong with you know people um like my family and i want to read this part because it's really good as far as describing uh their mentality he says this is chapter nine he says this was my world a world of truly irrational behavior we spend our way into the poor house we buy giant tvs and ipads our children wear nice clothes thanks to high interest credit cards and payday loans. We purchase homes we don't need, refinance them for more spending money, and declare bankruptcy, often leaving them full of garbage in our wake. Thrift is inimical to our being. We spend to pretend that we're upper class. And when the dust clears, when bankruptcy hits or a family member bails us out of our stupidity, there's nothing left over, nothing for the kids' college tuition, no investment to grow our wealth, no rainy day fund if someone loses her job. We know we shouldn't spend like this. Sometimes we beat ourselves up over it, but we do it anyway. All right, JD, you know, like on the one hand, the people on welfare, and he, this chapter contrasts people on welfare with the working poor. And really, the only difference between people on welfare and the working poor is that the working poor haven't applied for welfare to, to a certain extent. But the welfare system has changed over time. And some of the older rules were like irrational, where it didn't pay um, to work. I believe this was before welfare to work. Um, that happened during the Clinton years, but actually I'm a little bit unclear on that at the moment. But during the Clinton years, you got this, and we still do this, you know, requirement of to for people to work to a certain extent in usually in low wage jobs. It's sort of a low wage job welfare system where a lot of you know places like McDonald's can get their cheap cheaper labor right at subsidized by the government because then the government kicks in the rest of of what people need to barely live through welfare but anyway side note um but you know the, they're not that much difference except for that there's a certain type of person that just would rather struggle really hard than take welfare and let's face it you can take a certain amount of welfare and still find ways to make some money and to work to make your life better and not, you know, blow it if you want to. But you have a lot of temptations. And what's what JD is saying here is the working poor and the struggling lower middle class, I guess I would put put them into at different times, his family, suffers from these all these um temptations to spend money, just like the 
poor person on welfare who just wants a steak, okay? Just wants to eat a steak, goes into the grocery store and sees this juicy steak, right? And a, the six pack of beer. Can anyone blame a person if they do that? I'm not going to blame them. Um, and this is just a higher level of the same sort of thing, right? You want something, everybody else seems to be getting it. You really can't quite afford it, but the whole system is built around this kind of spending and you're going to be looked down upon if you don't have these things or so you feel. And so you give into the temptation and there's always a credit card company there to, uh, uh, to enable you. Uh, and that's good for the economy, right? So, and by the way, this description that he's given here is the description of the temptations all of us have even all the way up through the upper middle class until you get to the super wealthy, in which case they don't really even think in terms of temptation anymore. They just get what they want. Um, but yeah, like that, uh, you know, so there's no difference really is what I'm saying between the supposedly immoral temptations of the person on welfare and the supposedly immoral temptations of the poor working people or lower middle class, other than how much resource they can use to, you know, leverage what they want. And because the working poor can leverage more resource in the way of, say, credit card debt. Um, yeah, uh, they can get in over their heads, but it, it's the same it's the same exact mentality, right? And even um, many middle-class people, they don't quite get into the dire straits that J.D. Vance's family got into, but because they have used debt too much to obtain the things that they want, many, many, many of them are perpetually paying so much in the way of credit card and mortgage debt and car loan debt that they have nothing left over, no savings, scary thought going into retirement that all they're going to have is their social security payment if we still have social security. So it speaks to us all here, I think, um, his description. But it is not that, yes, there, you know, some people do have the backbone to say no, even when they could say yes. So yes, to a certain extent, it is the fault of the person who overspends and can't think about the long-term consequences. However, if we didn't have enough of those people, our economy would plummet. Okay, we have to keep that in mind. If there weren't people continually going into massive debt and overspending on stuff that they don't really need and throwing caution to the wind about their retirement, we'd be in another, I don't know, great recession. So there's that. And I just also don't want to judge people's behavior on the basis of what the few extraordinary people can do. Um, there will always be people in a society with gargantuan willpower. And yes, they do run rings around other people. It is a huge advantage to be able to not overspend, save, invest, and then, you know, their their retirement years are going to be so much better. Or the, you know, the type of person who can take advantage of whatever is in front of them and use it as smartly as possible and forego and delay gratification, they do tend to get ahead. But that's an exception and not the rule. And I think we need to be not hard on the rule, okay? The vast majority of human beings are normal. They're social beings. They look around them at all the other people, especially in the social media now, you know, that tells them the way of life that's admirable and that they should aspire to. They listen to advertisements and they view advertisements on the internet from sunup to sundown, telling them what they can buy and how they can make payments on it. And we expect these average normal people, which are the vast majority of us, to just keep saying no 
So I think that's unreasonable. It's not all them or even mainly them. And our our advertising industry is highly sophisticated and runs on psychological knowledge and social science research. So um, just some some thoughts there to kind of put that in context. But I do think that um, especially chapter nine is worth reading. And um, I, I would expect that, um, you know, as we move on into, I'll try to tackle like at least three chapters next time too, because there's actually, let me look here. There's 15 chapters in the book. So yeah, like I could get through maybe 10 through 12 and then do 13 through 15. So maybe two more sessions. Keep your comments coming. Uh, ask any questions that you want to ask. Uh, it is a book club, so there's we're going to do some interacting. Um, and I would once again encourage you to please support us at the Morin Academy on Patreon. Check out our website, too. Um, we offer a lot of different classes. There might be something for you there. Or even if you just like what I'm doing on this channel and you want to make sure I continue, um, please support the Morin Academy.